Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 16, The Age of Tyranny. Hardly had the nobles rid themselves of the position of Basileus when a new type of one-man rule arose throughout the Greek world as tyranny emerged during the late 7th century BC. As a consequence to all of these social and economic changes that began to take place in the 8th century BC. Modern historians have called this period from roughly 675 to 510 BC as the age of tyranny, although technically there will be tyrants later during the Hellenistic period, and not every Greek polis had tyrants either. The first time Tyrannos appeared on the Greek record, it is found in one of the fragments of the lyric poet Archilochus of Paros around 675 BC in connection to the Lydian king Gyges. He describes tyrants as having tremendous power and wealth, but they do not rule as legitimate monarchos, or hereditary king. They had seized power, usually through a military coup, and ruled as an autocrat, outside the institutions of the state. Tyranny was also found in myth. For example, the title of the famous play, Oedipus the King, in Greek is Oedipus Tyrannos, written by Sophocles. Tyranny in itself was not originally thought of as wicked. It was morally neutral and did not imply that the monarch was bad or cruel, just that he used illegitimate means to obtain sole power. Despite the myth, tyranny never reached Thebes, though. While background, aims, and means might differ, the general result was the subordination of local Greek nobilities to the power of a single man. Unfortunately, only a few of the dozens of tyrants who grabbed power in their polis are known in any detail. Still, we can see a general pattern in their rise and fall. Since the leader of the hoplite phalanx had a lot of power, if he wanted to seize control of the government, he already had the backing of the army. Thus, tyrants were often members of the local elites, who had distinguished themselves in service of their polis, and thus typically used times of public discontent to seize power. Not all tyrants were from the top-ranked families, however. Some were nobles who felt marginalized within the ruling class. Once the tyrants had established themselves, some held on to power by implementing mercenary soldiers from outside the polis as sort of bodyguards. Such aid was sometimes supplied by a friendly tyrant of another polis, or as in the case with many of the tyrants in late 6th century BC Ionia, by the Persians. In justifying their seize of power, they claimed to be fulfilling the will of the people, saving the city from weak or wrong leaders or putting an end to the vicious infighting between the noble families. Rivalries among the nobles, though it was channeled to some extent into competition for offices and control within the council, was particularly nasty in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, as the struggle for power was waged among the genoi, or lineage clans. Like the Homeric Basileus, a noble genos, the singular, was composed of a preeminent family that extended the umbrella of kinship over less prestigious noble oikoi, whose members supported the leader family and its political ambitions. Disputes among these factions, often among hot-headed young nobles, frequently erupted into bouts of violence and bloodshed. The Greeks called formal conflict between groups within the city-state stasis, which literally means taking a stand. Opposition of this sort was integral to the Greek political process of every period, but the stasis between noble factions in the Archaic period was much more frequently violent than at any point afterwards and was highly disruptive to society. And because membership in a genois was hereditary, this kind of civil war would keep flaring up for generations. The intervention of a strong man who could stop or at least check the feuds of the noble families was welcomed by the rest of the people. This idea that the tyrants were viewed as champions of the demos against the oppressive nature of the nobility was reinforced by Aristotle in his politics, saying, A tyrant is installed in power from among the demos and the masses to oppose the nobles so that the demos may suffer no injustice from them. This is clear from the events of history, for almost all the tyrants have gained power from being demagogues, so to speak, having gained their trust by slandering the nobles. The seizure of power was often followed by violence against the rich, and presumably some of it was given to the poor to keep their support. Thus, since the nobles no longer had a monopoly of the land, tyrants helped in spreading the wealth. In order to bolster credibility, 
tyrants did their best to uphold existing laws, customs, and religious practices. They often made laws to limit the power and privilege of the nobility, including sumptuary laws, which sought to curb their luxury and ostentation. In order to maintain popularity, tyrants often engaged in public works projects designed to increase the prestige of their home cities, which led to urbanization and an increase in trade and commerce. People began to flock to the capital city of the polis, where the tyrant lived, because that was where government, commerce, and industry were happening. Thus, the tyrants needed to increase their city's water supplies, so aqueducts, wells, fountains, and drainage systems were installed. A central place in the city, called the Agora, came about for political and religious purposes. At some point, it became a center for commerce. The tyrant also funded public buildings, such as courts and homes for public magistrates. He beautified them to impress the people. The most important, however, was temples. Previously, they were made out of wood, and thus deteriorated. But with the new wealth, they could afford to create them in marble. The tyrants also instituted new religious cults and festivals that celebrated and strengthened the unity of the polis. And they were patrons of the arts, competing to attract the best artists for architecture, sculpture, vase painting, poetry, songs, and music. All of this was monopolized by the nobility until this point. The first tyrant in Greece was Phidon of Argos, a very important polis early on. According to tradition, he was a vigorous and energetic ruler and greatly increased the power of Argos. Herodotus records that Phidon carried out the most arrogant action ever of all the Greeks when he expelled the Elian presidents from the Olympic Games and presided over them himself. According to later sources, Pisa gained control of the Olympics in 668 BC. In doing so, it can be argued that they would have needed the help of an external military power to achieve this coup, and Herodotus' mention of Phidon's intervention at Olympia makes him the most likely candidate. Thus, if we accept 668 BC as the date of Phidon's military intervention at Olympia, then Phidon can be linked, although Pausanias doesn't list anyone as the commander. With the major victory of the Argive army over the Spartans at the Battle of Hesia a year earlier in 669 BC, Hesia lies on the plain of Thurea that bordered the territories between Argos and Sparta, and the likely cause of the conflict was the expansion of these two powers disputing control of the plain. As we will see in future episodes, this took place before Sparta's army came to be the best in Greece, although it was still a formidable force which emphasizes the excellence of the Argive army in the early 7th century BC. Thus, it seems that Phidon restored strong central government to Argos and masterminded the expansion of Argive power throughout the Argolid. His object was to secure the predominance of Argos in the northern Peloponnese, which led to the Battle of Hesia with Sparta, who had dominance in the south. If the previous evidence is accepted, then the likely cause of Argos' brief revival of military dominance and Phidon's ability to grab power illegitimately was most likely due to the introduction of fully evolved hoplite warfare. As we saw in a previous episode, the grip on the hoplite shield was generically called Argive because either Argos was the first state to introduce hoplite warfare in all of its glory, or were remembered by later Greeks for their outstanding skill with it. Phidon is mentioned in Aristotle's politics as a baseless king who became Tyrannos. Thus, we can speculate that he was a hereditary Basileus, who was the greatest among the noblemen early on, until he seized absolute power, becoming a tyrant. If Phidon was the inventor and leader of the hoplites, then it is possible that he saw his opportunity to make use of his new military force to overthrow the nobility and to advance his own career. His political success, with the help of the hoplites, would have set a precedent for others to follow. Aristotle also claims that he made changes to land reforms by making family plots equal, even if the citizens had all started with plots of unequal size. Herodotus states that Phidon imposed a uniform system of weights and measures, called the Phidonian measures, on the Peloponnese, which would remain the standard for a long time. They seem to have been closely linked with the Agenetan system of weights, or may even have been a different name for the same system. If Forrest adds that he was the first to coin silver money, Herodotus claims it was the Lydians. Regardless, the oldest known Agenetan coins are of the 6th century BC. Furthermore, in the list of suitors of Agoristi, daughter of Cleisthenes of Sicyon, given by Herodotus, there occurs the name of Leochetes, son of Phidon of Argos. Since Phidon flourished in the mid-7th century BC, 
His son could not have been a suitor in the mid-6th century BC, during the tyranny of Cleisthenes of Sicyon. So it seems that either both Ephorus and Herodotus were mistaken, or there was another fight on at Argos later, which isn't impossible. Regardless, most scholars agree that a system of weights and measures, those of the Agenetans, was already in existence in the time of the later Phaidon, at which point he introduced certain changes. In any event, the early Phaidon was said to have lost his life in a faction fight at Corinth, where the monarchy had recently been overthrown, and thus, to Corinth we must turn our attention. During the Dark Ages, Corinth was ruled by the descendants of their legendary king, Bacchus. But according to tradition, in 747 BC, the last Basileus, Telestes, was overthrown and killed by his own kinsmen, collectively known as the Bacchiaidae, or descendants of Bacchus. Their dominance of the newly created annual offices of Pyrtanus, the chief magistrate, and Polemarchus, the war leader, the Bacchiaidae, said to number more than 200, governed Corinth for most of the next century. Their assertion of common descent from Bacchus was probably fictitious, but was very useful as a way of legitimizing their control of the government. In actuality, they were a narrow oligarchy of prominent wealthy oikoi. To ensure their exclusivity, the families married only among themselves. However, Corinth benefited from their leadership, developing into a unified state. Large-scale public buildings were also constructed at this time. During the 8th century BC, Corinth had exploited the success of the Eubians, who had established trading posts at Almina in the east and Pithecusae in the west. By being the pivotal point on this trade route of western metals and eastern luxury goods, the voyage around the Peloponnese was so dangerous that traders on the east-west trade route preferred either to drag their ships across the Corinthian Isthmus or to trade at Corinth, which was more often the case. Thus, this made the city with its two harbors the most important trading center, and according to Strabo, they earned a substantial revenue from the imposition of tolls. In addition, the Corinthians were prolific in their production of pottery for export, and presumably other goods that have not survived the ravages of time. The establishment of lucrative colonies at Corsaira and Syracuse, and the transportation of non-Corinthian colonists in their triremes, as you will recall from two episodes ago, that they were the first among the Greeks to have this kind of vessel ensured that the bulk of the trade and the supplies for the western colonies originated from or passed through Corinth. Because of this, Corinth soon became the wealthiest Greek city of the era. But a consequence of this was that there were many non-nobles who were beneficiaries of the wealth flowing into Corinth. Some of these newly wealthy people wanted political power, but the Bacchiaidae refused to admit these wealthy entrepreneurs into its ranks and give them a share in the government. Furthermore, things began to sour after Corinth came out the losers in a series of unpopular wars. The Corinthians may have been defeated in a border war with the Megarians. There is a memorial of the Olympic athlete, or Sippus of Megara, dated to around 700 BC, which praised his success in driving out hostile invaders from his homeland. Thucydides mentions that the earliest Greek sea battle, of which he had knowledge at least, took place between Corinth and its colony Corsaira in 664 BC. He gives no information about the result or the cause of the battle, but it's significant that Corinth was at war with one of its major colonies, which was strategically important for the western trade route. Although it is not written, the rise of Phaidon of Argos may have also caused military problems for Corinth. Criticism of their foreign policy failures, exacerbated by their exclusive retention of power, inevitably led them to suppress dissent, which only increased their unpopularity. Thus, the stage was set for tyranny. At one point, a woman named Labda, who was a member of the Bacchiaidae, but since she was lame, nobody wished to marry her. Therefore, she was allowed to marry outside the family, and took as her husband a man named Etion, who had gained wealth and distinction in Corinthian society through trade. When Labda failed to conceive, Etion consulted the Delphic Oracle. Her response was recorded in Herodotus. No one honors you, although you are worthy of honor. Labda is pregnant and will bear a great rock, and it will own the ruling men and will bring justice to Corinth. The prophecy thus came to the attention of the Bacchiaidae, who immediately confirmed it with another oracle. And as soon as the child was born, they sent ten men to kill the baby. But the newborn smiled at each of the men as they were about to kill it, and none of them could go through with the plan. Then, giving the baby back to Labda, they went out into the courtyard and lambasted each other for their weakness. 
When the men finally composed themselves and returned to kill the baby, they could not find it, because Labda had heard what was being said at the door and had hidden the baby away in a jar, which is called Kipsile in Greek. Hence the baby's name became Kipsilis. To save their own tales, the men falsely reported to the back Yidae that the deed was done. Nicholas of Damascus, the historian of the Roman Emperor Augustus, whose work contains out of Ephorus, gives insight into Kipsilis's life. After escaping death, he was then sent abroad as a baby. When he returned to Corinth in manhood, he became one of the most admired of Corinth's citizens because he was courageous, prudent, and helpful to the people, unlike the oligarchs in power, who were insolent and violent. He was elected Polemarchus and treated debtors with great consideration both of which increased his popularity amongst the people. So he used his influence with the army to usurp sole power in 657 BC, and then either had the remainder of his family killed or expelled from Corinth, thus fulfilling the prophecy. He confiscated their property and recalled the exiles and restored citizen rights to those who had been deprived of them under the Bacchiaidae. Nicolaus of Damascus says that Kipsilis ruled Corinth mildly, having no bodyguard and enjoying popularity amongst the Corinthians. Herodotus, on the other hand, says that Kipsilis was a violent ruler, but that is doubtful. Legendary stories of miraculous escapes as a baby from death are traditionally associated with heroes, like Noah, Perseus, Sargon, and Romulus, for example. The fact that he didn't need a bodyguard meant that he had the willing support of the middle-class hoplites. His reign lasted 30 years, from 657 to 627 BC, a testimony to his general popularity. That doesn't mean, however, that he didn't enact any unpopular decisions. Aristotle reports that Kipsilis made a vow to Zeus that if he became master of Corinth, he would offer to Zeus the property of the Corinthians. Thus, having achieved that, he imposed taxes on the people, which had never happened before in Greece. Previously, it was only normal to pay customs duties on trade. The Greeks saw taxes as what barbarians gave to their kings. There were also laws forbidding men to acquire a large number of slaves to live excessively beyond their income, and from preventing country folk from emigrating into the city, presumably because the city was swelling with population, as more and more people were flocking to Corinth to get in on the trade action. One of the exiled Bacchiaidae, a man named Demaratus, fled to Italy, where he settled at the Etruscan city of Tarquini. According to tradition, Demaratus introduced many aspects of Greek culture to central Italy and imported much Corinthian pottery to the Etruscans. He married an Etruscan noblewoman and had two sons, Aarons and Lucius Tarquinius. Aarons died shortly before his father, but Lucius, who as the son of a foreigner, was unable to attain high political position at Tarquini. So he migrated to Rome, where wealth, nobility, and ambition weren't bound by ancient traditions yet. While in Rome, he used his father's fortune to fund public projects and eventually won the favor of the king, Ancus Marcius and when the king died, Lucius was chosen to succeed him. Thus, Demaratus was the progenitor of a line of Etruscan kings that ruled Rome, but like Demaratus and Corinth, they too would be ousted during a political revolution. Of course, this is referring to the establishment of the Roman Republic, but that is for another time, and another podcast. In any event, back to Corinth. Upon his death, Kipsilis was succeeded as tyrant by his son Periander who ruled for 40 years, from 627 to 585 BC, and continued the Golden Age of Corinth. Both Kipsilis and Periander set about exploiting the economic opportunities of northwest Greece. They founded colonies on the Ionian island of Lucas, modern Lefkada, on the Arcananian coastline at Anactorion and at Ambracia, and on the Illyrian coastline in modern-day Albania at Apollonia and at Epidamnus with the help of Corsaira, which would imply that the tyrants had healed the former rift with their colony. These colonial foundations were not only protective staging posts on the western trade route to Italy, but also provided access for Corinthian manufacturers and traders to the interior of northwestern Greece, which allowed them to acquire raw materials, such as timber and flowers for perfume production, and to import Corinthian manufactured goods. Under Periander's direction, Corinth was the most powerful and prosperous than it had ever been before, but tyranny by its very nature was almost bound to be less popular in the second than in the first generation. 
Periander had to face increasing opposition at home and towards the end of his life had to rely on repression. His total achievement, however, was very considerable. While his father had concentrated on the West, he broke new ground by sending one of his sons to establish a colony at Patadia on the westernmost promontory of the Halkidiki Peninsula. More important was his deliberate promotion of Corinthian influence in the East. As we discussed last episode, Periander's main ally in the East was Thrasybulus, tyrant of Miletus. This was a reversal of relationships under the Bacchiaidae, who held them as a former enemy in the Lelantine War. But they needed to cultivate a relationship with the Milesians in order to gain access to the markets of the eastern Mediterranean. The influence of Miletus in the Black Sea was paramount and after its war with Aliates, the Milesians were on good terms with the rich Lydian court at Sardis. It is not coincidence that Corinthian pottery was more widely distributed in the east in the early 6th century BC. The close ties between the two tyrants is illustrated in Herodotus. Early in his tyranny, Periander sent a messenger to Thrasybulus for political advice. Thrasybulus, instead of responding, took the messenger for a walk in a field of wheat. As they walked, he sliced off all of the tallest stalks of wheat and told him to report what he had seen to Periander. The message was clear. A wise ruler would preempt challenges to his rule by removing those prominent men who might be powerful enough to challenge him. Afterwards, Periander became far more bloodthirsty towards his rivals than his father. Periander's increased reputation in the Greek world is also confirmed by the choice of and the acceptance of his arbitration when he supported the Athenian occupation of Sigium at the entrance to the Hellespont, which Mytilene had challenged. More on that in a future episode. Anyway, in doing so, their support for Athens brought the Athenians within their sphere of influence for trading purposes and away from Aegina, who was Corinth's commercial rival. This forging of good diplomatic relations for trade purposes was also undertaken with non-Greek rulers, as presents were sent to Aliates of Lydia, and Periander's nephew was even named Samatikos after the king of Egypt. It may have been the canal works of Necho that influenced his decision to attempt to cut a canal through the isthmus to link the Corinthian Gulf with the Aegean. But the rock was too hard, and his sources were too limited to achieve what even the Romans would find was too formidable later on. Periander did, however, devise an alternative which partially fulfilled the function of a canal. A stoned paveway was built across the isthmus with two parallel grooves to fit a carriage on, which light boats could be transported from one sea to the other. This diolkos, or dragway, as it was called, could not take larger merchantmen, however, but their cargoes could be carried across and reloaded on another ship. The rule of Periander saw important developments in the arts and crafts at Corinth. We will go into greater detail of some of these developments in the next two episodes, but for now, just know that he had the poet Arion come from Lesbos to Corinth for an arts festival in the city. Periander built many temples in the Doric style, such as the Great Stone Temple to Apollo. The Corinthian style of pottery was developed by an artesian during his rule. Periander was said to be a patron of literature, who both wrote and appreciated early philosophy. He is said to have written a didactic poem, 2,000 lines long. Periander was often considered one of the seven sages of Greece, and thus Diogenes Laertes wrote a life of Periander in his famous work, The Lives of the Eminent Philosophers. For this reason, plus Herodotus, we have a fair amount of detail for Periander's life. Some scholars have argued that the Corinthian ruler named Periander was a different person from the sage of the same name. Diogenes Laertes even admits that there might have been two Perianders. Aristotle says that it was the Corinthian Periander, however, who was the wise one, but Plato disagrees. In any event, we will cover these sages in a future episode. Periander, though, was not as adept with his home life. He married Melissa, the daughter of Proclus, who had made himself tyrant of Epidaurus. They had two sons, the elder Cypselus after his grandfather, though he was said to be weak-minded and dull, and the younger Lycophron, a man of intelligence. According to Diogenes Laertes, in a fit of rage, Periander either kicked his wife or threw her down a set of stairs so hard that she was killed. Herodotus alluded to rumors that Periander had engaged in intercourse with the corpse of his wife, stating that Periander baked his bread in a cold oven. If you take out the creepiness from that statement, it is an absolutely brilliant metaphor, among one of the many reasons that Herodotus is my favorite Greek author. In any event, 
Melissa's death led to an irreconcilable quarrel with his youngest son, Lycophron. The story goes that Procles had invited his two grandchildren to his court. When they were departing, he asked them if they knew who killed their mother. The elder was dull and did not understand, but the words sank into the heart of Lycophron, and henceforth he showed disdain and suspicion of his father. When Periander discovered what Proclus had said, he waged war with Epidaurus, resulting in Proclus being captured and killed. Afterwards, Lycophron went on a self-imposed exile to Corsaira. As the years went on and Periander was growing old, seeing that his elder son was a dimwit, he wished for Lycophron to succeed him as tyrant. But his son refused to return unless Periander would simultaneously relocate to his current home on the island of Corsaira. He had agreed, but the inhabitants of Corsaira were apparently so worried about having him living on their island that they killed Lycophron in order to prevent the swap. For this act, Periander took savage vengeance and fell into a depression that eventually led to his death in 585 BC. Thus, Periander's nephew, Samatikos, stood next in line for succession. But by the end of his reign, Periander had lost the support of Corinth with his harsh rule and persisting hostility. So after 70 years and two generations of tyranny, the Corinthians were ready for a change and had the young Samatikos assassinated three years later. With him, the tyranny of the Kypsilids came to an end, and a moderate oligarchy was firmly established, based on a board of eight magistrates and a council of 80 men. In order to celebrate this event, the leading families of Corinth instituted the first Isthmian Games in 582 BC. Although Corinth was now free from tyranny, an example that other Greek polis would soon follow, the city soon lost its cutting-edge status in technological innovations to an upstart Athens. At the same time, Corsaira became independent and hostile again, but Corinth retained its influence and was on friendly terms over their other colonies. Ethnic differences among the Greeks, revealed in their dialects and customs, were sufficiently pronounced to cause political problems at different times in their history. Ethnic divisions were felt more strongly in the Peloponnese, where the differences between the original Achaean Greeks and the so-called Dorian invaders were accentuated by the reduction of these pre-Dorians to a form of serfdom. The most renowned example was the Helots of Sparta, made by the Spartan conquest of Messenia. More on that in future episodes. But there were other groups in a similar position, the so-called naked ones at Argos, the dusty feet at Epidaurus, and the sheepskin cloak wearers at Sicyon. However, it is also clear that many non-Dorians were admitted to citizenship by their conquerors. Apart from the three traditional Dorian tribes found throughout the Dorian states, called the Dimenes, Heles, and Pamphloi, there often existed a fourth tribe, which bore a different name in each state, such as Agiales and Sicyon, which contained these non-Dorian citizens. Although many states did achieve a degree of ethnic harmony, the evidence of the events in Sicyon reveals the tensions that probably existed below the surface in a number of states, as can also be identified in the political struggles between the inhabitants of pre-Dorian Pisa and the Dorian Elia. Orthagoras of Sicyon also was a Polemarchus, and thus seized the power and reversed that situation in the mid-7th century BC. It's quite possible that he had seen what Kypsilis had done at Corinth, and thus was inspired to achieve the same thing at Sicyon. Although his tyranny was roughly contemporary with Kypsilis, we know much less about his though, but Aristotle asserts that his tyranny, and that of his successors, lasted for a hundred years, due to the mildness of their rule, their respect for the law, and their concern for their subjects' welfare, which were, of course, similar qualities that underpin the tyranny of the Kypsilids. Little is known about his two successors, but his grandson, Cleisthenes, who ruled from around 600 to 570 BC, attracted the attention of Herodotus by his overtly ethnic policies. Cleisthenes was one of the great figures of his day and could stand in comparison as a ruler with Periander. The makeup of Sicyon was very different from that of Corinth. While Corinth was primarily a trading city with restricted farmland and had played a leading part in colonization, Sicyon had sent out no colonies, and its land was rich in vegetation. But Sicyon also had a larger amount of pre-Dorians in its population. 
Sikion had originally been occupied by Dorians from Argos, and thus it may have been an Argive attempt to control Sikion that led to war and to a strong anti-Dorian reaction in Sikion. In any event, according to Herodotus, when Sikion was at war with Argos, Cleisthenes made clear his bitter hatred of Argos. He stopped the recitation of Homeric poems because they praised Argive deeds. After his failure to remove the shrine of the Argive hero, Adratus, from the center of Sikion, as he was refused permission by the Delphic oracle, he persuaded the Thebans to give him the statue of Adratus' mortal enemy, Melanippus, build a shrine to his memory, and transferred to him the religious festival and honors that had previously been conducted in honor of Adrastus. He took a step further by changing the names of the three Dorian tribes in Sicyon so that the Argives and Siconians would not have the same names. This was very rare, because people did not like to mess with tribal things, which goes to show you how much Cleisthenes hated Argos. In fact, this may be the first use of political propaganda in Greek history, since the previous Dorian rulers had called his tribe Agiales, or Goatmen, Cleisthenes poetically also renamed the three Dorian tribes after farm animals. Coriete, Swinemen, Aniete, the Assmen, and Hiata, Pigmen. The non-Dorian tribe was renamed Archelaoi, or Rulers of the People. It's possible that Cleisthenes was beginning to experience the increasing unpopularity that was a common characteristic of all tyrannies in their second and third generations of rule, and that he was deliberately stirring up hatred among his own non-Dorian ethnic group and promising privileged treatment in order to rally their support behind his tyranny. Aristotle says the events at Sicyon are an example of one tyranny replacing another with the implication that there was a difference between Cleisthenes and his predecessors, and this may reflect his use of ethnic prejudice in his pursuit of power. Under Cleisthenes, Sicyon became a regional power in the Gulf of Corinth. When Delphi was attacked in this first sacred war from 595 to 585 BC, Cleisthenes led the defense. Since the sanctuary of Delphi lay in the territory of the Phocian town of Crissa, they claimed control and imposed taxes on the visitors who passed through their land to consult the oracle. Naturally, this caused strong complaints and reduced the resources of the oracle. Thus, Delphi desired to free themselves from their control, and they naturally looked for help to the great Amphictyonic League to the north, in which the Thessalians, the ancient foes of the Phogians, were now the dominant member. Thus, the Amphictyons received kindly the cause of Delphi and declared a holy war against Crissa. Cleisthenes led a force from Sicyon across the gulf to blockade the city's port. The Athenians also contributed a force under Alcmion, whose family, as we shall see, had been put under a curse a generation earlier and would also welcome a change in the control of Delphi. The combined land forces then laid Crissa under siege. Details of the siege are missing, but according to the medical writer, Thessalos, who wrote in the 5th century BC, the attackers discovered a secret water pipe leading into the city. An Asclepiadus, or medical doctor, named Nebros, then advised them to poison the water with hellebore, which rendered the defenders so weak with diarrhea that they were unable to resist the assault. Crissa was captured and the entire population was slaughtered. Nebros was an ancestor of Hippocrates, so this story has led to some scholars speculating that it may have been guilt over his ancestors' use of poison that drove Hippocrates to establish the Hippocratic Oath. According to Pausanias, Solon of Athens diverted the course of the river Pleistus so it didn't run through Crissa to defeat them by thirst, but they were able to get enough water from their wells. So he then added the hellebore to the water himself, regardless of who. Afterwards, Crissa's lands were dedicated to Apollo, Leda, Artemis, and Athena. They were forbidden from being cultivated or to allow animals to graze on them. After this, the Pythian Games were instituted in 582 BC, under the direction of the Amphictyons, and henceforth they became the official overseer and military defender of Delphi. Cleisthenes was the victor in the first chariot race in the new Hippodrome, built in the plain below the ruins of Crissa. Six years after that, he won the four-horse chariot race at the Olympic Games, and Cleisthenes became an international celebrity. As most other tyrants, Cleisthenes had a lot of wealth and a huge ego, so he would not marry his daughter, Agoristi, off to just anyone. 
Thus, he invited the best noble men in Greece to spend a year in Sicyon at his expense to compete for Agoristes' hand in marriage. Herodotus read off all of the names, copying Homer's description of the catalog of ships. During that year, he entertained the suitors and tested their characters, pride, intelligence, athletic prowess, and manners, especially at the dinner table. Eventually, two finalists emerged, Hippocleides and Megacles, both of whom were from Athens. Hippocleides had the edge because of his connection with the Kypsilids of Corinth, but that only lasted until he disgraced himself in an impressive manner. On the day of the decision, after dinner, when the two suitors were doing their best to talk persuasively and make pleasing music, Hippocleides took control and ordered the flute player to give him a tune. Well, he had a little bit too much to drink and started dancing widely on top of a table, and finally, as Herodotus puts it, he stood on his head by making feet hands. This appalled Cleisthenes, who says, You have danced the bride away. And thus he chose Megacles as the winner. Hippocleides' response was, O Fontis Hippocleides, which literally means, Hippocleides doesn't care. This phrase, according to Herodotus, became a common expression in the Greek world. The phrase was well known to later authors. Aristophanes phrases it in The Wasps, and Plutarch, who disliked Herodotus, says the author would dance away the truth like Hippocleides. Herodotus' description insinuates a pun. The phrase, dance the bride away, may also be read as, displayed your testicles, in reference to Hippocleides standing on his head while wearing a tunic, which would have exposed his genitals to the guests. Once again, Herodotus shows himself to be a magnificent wordsmith. Don't worry though, this won't be the last time we come across our dear friend Hippocleides. In the age of tyrants and for some time after, it was normal practice for leading men to seek marriage alliances in other states. And it is worth noting that three of the four tyrannies that we have discussed had links with Athens. The grandfather of Hippocleides was Kypsilis. The daughter of Theogonus was married to Chilon, a noble who made an unsuccessful bid for tyranny in Athens, as we will see. From the marriage of Agoristi and Megacles came another Cleisthenes, who later would have an important role in the development of democracy in Athens. And their second son, Hippocrates, had a daughter named Agoristi after her grandmother, and she in turn was to be the mother of Pericles, who guided Athens during its golden age. Cleisthenes did not live long past his daughter's marriage, and soon after his death, his successor, Ascanes, was expelled by the Spartans in 556 BC, bringing an end to the Siconian tyranny. Sicyon was forced to become an ally of the Spartans for more than a century. The fact that the Dorian Spartans did not attempt to reverse the insulting names of the Dorian tribes is a sign that the power and influence of the non-Dorian element in Sicyon was supreme, and the Spartans needed to retain their goodwill. Megara had been settled last of the Dorian cities in the Dark Age, and thus grown up in the shadow of Corinth. They had followed Corinth to Sicily to establish colonies, but it was probably bad relations with Corinth that ended their western ambitions due to the border war between the two states around 700 BC that we discussed earlier. Because of these hostilities, it's possible that this is the reason the Megarians felt they needed to direct their colonization away from the west to the northeast, where they found it Halcydon and Byzantium in the early 7th century BC, discussed last episode. Megara needed to colonize because her territory, squeezed in between Attica and Corinth, could not provide for a growing population, and the best land was controlled by the nobility. It was as the champion of the small farmers that Theogonus was able to seize power. In his rhetoric, Aristotle states that those who are plotting tyranny ask for a bodyguard, and then compares Theogonus with Pisistratus of Athens, who as he points out, when granted a bodyguard, became a tyrant a possible insight into how Theogonus managed to gain control of Megara, and also insight into how the Greek concept of Tyrannos might be linked with a bodyguard. In his politics, Aristotle mentions that the gesture that led to his tyranny was a massive slaughter of the cattle of the rich, would presumably result in a free banquet for the poor. He was able to do this because he had the confidence of the people, probably due to being a military general. Thucydides states that Chilon of Athens married Theogonus' daughter. When Chilon unsuccessfully attempted to establish a tyranny in Athens in 632 BC, it was from Theogonus that he obtained a force. Theogonus' tyranny would be short-lived, however, 
His most permanent memorial was a fountain house, which brought a good supply of water to the city. However, the nobles fought back and banished him. Plutarch mentions that after Theogonus was cast out, the Megarians enjoyed a conservative government for a short while. However, Plutarch does not expand on the nature of the exile. The tyranny had been too short to carry through the revolution, and there followed a long period of unsettlement in which the nobles fought violently to squash any sort of social and political changes. It was not long before the importance of Megara dwindled as a power in Greece. The war with Athens, which resulted in the loss of the island of Salamis, was to be decisive for its decline and the rise of its rival. Tyranny was a transitional phase in Greek society, but very important nonetheless, since it was needed to break the stalemate of the old nobility who were resisting the changes of the hoplite revolution and the growing merchant and economic classes. It thus laid the foundation for the middle class, hoplite-dominated constitutions that followed. Typically, once a tyranny was overthrown, the nobles who had been banished returned and re-established an oligarchy. However, oligarchic rule was forever changed, because now the nobility were forced to include those who had wealth by merit, not just by birth. If they hadn't, someone else down the road would try to make himself tyrant once again. But it wasn't long before these people very quickly formed into factions competing for dominance in the state. The hoplite class of independent farmers also now had a role in this new government, although it varied between each polis. Some had councils that included all of the hoplites, and others had ones that were very narrow in scope. Regardless, they now had somewhat of a say in the government. Despite all of the positive influences tyrants had on their polis, tyrants were almost universally vilified in retrospect. At first, the word tyranny had no real negative connotation as the common people viewed the first generations of tyrants in a more favorable light, because for the most part, they ruled mildly, as they depended on the goodwill of the people to maintain their position. Thus, the founder of the dynasty most likely was loved when he died, and that love declined with his son, since they were not his achievements, and were heirs to a non-existent political office. He typically was not as charismatic as his father. A few did succeed on their own merits, but it was usually the second generation, and most tyrannies only lasted two generations, that showed all of the hallmarks of the traditional wicked tyrant leading to their overthrow, because they were forced to resort to oppressive measures to repress opposition, which naturally exacerbated resentment against them. In this way, the word tyrant eventually came to mean a wicked and oppressive despo, in part because of the behavior of the second generation of rulers and the propaganda spread by the nobles who naturally hated the men who had overthrown their regime and brought shame to all ruling factions by forcing them to cede power to one of their own. Also, the common people were forced to face the grim reality of their own political impotence. Thus, both sides were troubled over their lack of being autonomous, and this is reflective in later political thought. Later Greeks perceived that dictatorial rule by one man, not accountable to the demos, threaten the freedom of all in any political regime had to be responsible for its actions in order to be legitimate, because no human being can be trusted with complete power. Sparta had developed a reputation of being the enemy of tyranny and fought many times against it. They saw tyrants as being violent, limiting free speech and political life, and being arrogant. In Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound, Zeus is portrayed as a tyrant who punishes Prometheus for his good deeds towards men. Plato recognized tyranny as a terrible, evil thing, as the natural way of life for barbarians, not the Greeks. We discussed earlier how these tyrants were patrons of the arts. Well, we are going to take a break from our narrative for the next couple of episodes, and circle back and discuss the artistic development taking place in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, a period some scholars refer to as the Greek Renaissance, because this period developed the art and intellectual thought that Greece is known for. Greek prose and poetry came to life. New techniques of working raw materials produced a new kind of sculpture, new architectural designs of the temple, and new metallurgy. And Greece's reconnection with the Near East changed the face of Greek pottery. So join us next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 17, Archaic Art and Architecture. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play.
Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, Hymn to Hermes, from his album, The Ancient Greek Lyre. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.